My name is Laura Villarreal. I'm here with U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Lamon, who I have the honor of interviewing today for the Letras Latinas Oral History Project. This is our first oral history project with you, so I think we should begin at the beginning. For the purpose of documentation, please tell us where you were born and grew up. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to be doing this and to be part of these. My name is Ada Limon, and I was born in Sonoma, California, and grew up in Sonoma, California, and Glen Ellen, California. Where does your story begin as a writer? What made you want to become a poet? I love this question, and there's many ways to untangle it from my life. I think that for me, it began with a different kind of listening. Sometimes we talk about looking when it comes to poets, but for me, it was a different kind of listening. I could hear a voice underneath the voice. That was me. I didn't know what that was. And I wanted to pay more attention to it. There was a place across the street from where I was raised. I moved in when I was six months old. And there was a creek called the Calabasas Creek. Mm. It was a little path to get to it. Yeah. It wasn't like your big Texas beautiful rivers. It was very yeah. <laughs> small, more of a small California creek. There was this silence there that I felt really interested in and curious about. It felt like a world that existed outside of time. Every time I think about where my poems start, it's there. Mm. That's where I feel like they begin. Yeah. I don't know why, but that's maybe where I first heard the voice underneath the voice of the whole world. That was the beginning. I don't know how old I was, probably five or six. Correct me if I'm wrong, but your mother's an artist? My mother's a painter. Did that have any influence? Absolutely. I think it was the value and care that my family had with the making of art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And having that as a model, yeah. knowing that it was important to make something that it was valued to make something that you could spend your whole day making a thing. And I had the beautiful reality of growing up with someone who did that. Yeah. I was very lucky. Yeah. A lot of permission granted. That's incredible. I first came to your work in grad school. We were just talking about Rigoberto Gonzalez, and I was in our class. It's called Writers at Newark, and we were reading your book, Sharks in the Rivers. Felt like an awakening to me. I came straight from undergrad to the MFA program and I hadn't experienced work like yours. It was influential for me as a young Latina writer. It cleared the way for me to make space for my own writing in the world and how I wanted to see it. Mm -hmm. I wonder what poets have been foundational to your work and in what ways have they influenced the writing? Thank you for saying that. That means a lot to me. Sharks in the Rivers was a very important book. To me, I love Rigoberto Gonzalez, so I'm just <laughs> happy to have him here in our hearts. When I was first in undergraduate, that's when I started studying poetry. Mm -hmm. I remember finding the poems from Elizabeth Bishop, Anne Sexton, Lucille Clifton, and feeling this is something I want to make. I'm interested in how to make this. And then on a personal note, I still remember the one of the only books. I'm not someone who stands in line for to get a book signed. I don't know why. I just never have been. I think there's a level where I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to bother the person or yeah. whatever. <laughs> but I did get my book signed by Francisco X. Arlocon for his book, the one with the snakes on it. The Snake Stories, I think it's called, Snakes. I always think about his kindness and the way that he not only showed me so much generosity on a one-on-one -on -one level, yeah. but that book for me was a really important, pivotal book. I bought myself and I was 15 at the bookstore that I worked oh. for. I cherish it. I still have the copy at home with his signature. Oh, that's incredible. I know that he's been influential for a lot of people. Yeah. You worked at a bookstore? I did. 15? I worked at a bookstore, an independent bookstore that is still there, Reader's Books in Sonoma. Mm -hmm. And I walked across the street because it was across the street from the apartment I was raised in. Mm -hmm. Once my parents split, I said, I live right there and I'll never be late. <laughs> I worked there on and off from to 21. Have you read there? I have. Oh, I okay. do every book that comes out. I do a launch there. It's where I do my home tour launches. Besides California, you lived in New York for a while. Early in your career, you worked for Con Condé Nast. Uh, mag magazines like Martha Stewart Living, Travel and Leisure, and GQ. 
What was the experience like? Did working at magazines teach you anything that's helped you in your life as a poet? I think it's important to think about the ways that artists make a living. Mm. There's a level of privilege that's assumed where we aren't supposed to talk about it. It's actually really important to talk about the way that we support ourselves. Not everybody wants to teach and not everybody can teach because there's not a lot of teaching positions out there in the world. Mm. And so I remember after graduate school really trying to figure out what my pathway forward was, that I could stay in New York City to make my rent not go too far into debt. Graduate school put me there anyway. I was lucky enough to get a temp job. My first temp job was at GQ magazine. Slowly but surely, I worked my way around magazines and event productions until I landed in different places. Condé Nast was a home for quite a few of them. From my first temp job right out of graduate school, I was eventually the copy director at GQ Magazine, the last full-time job I had there was creative services director for Travel and Leisure Magazine. I think one of the things that I liked about doing it and I liked about the experience was not only there were some great people that worked there Mm -hmm. and good teams. It was lucky to be in that creative field. So you're working with designers and people who care about language and photos and all of those things. That's exciting that there is still this idea of making, crafting something that matters, not just creating content. Yeah. Uh, which I feel like we can lead towards more towards now. But I think that it allowed me in some ways to have some sort of basic security so that I could write whatever poems I wanted to write. Mm-hmm. And that was really important. It felt like I had a separate life, a separate career, and then I could really support myself as an artist and allow myself whatever freedom I wanted to have. Those two worlds felt very separate to me, Mm -hmm. but equally valuable. It wasn't until 2010 when my stepmother passed away in February and I gave my notice in August and left in September. My stepmother died of colon cancer at 52. Even though I was in my early 30s, I thought, none of us know. Mm -hmm. how long we have on this planet. None of us know what kind of time we have left. So what do you want to devote yourself to? How do you want to spend your time? And even though I love New York City and I loved the team that I worked with, I knew more than anything that I wanted to be a full-time artist. I didn't know exactly what that looked like and what it would entail. But I moved out of New York City in 2010, back to Sonoma for six months, almost for a year, and really did my best to devote myself to the creative life. You went back home for six months. Did you go anywhere after that? My now husband, then partner, was moving to Kentucky. Oh. And (laughs) he really wanted me to come with him. That's how we ended up in Kentucky. Kentucky became a beautiful space for me to write. I still had to freelance for all the magazines I worked for, but I had more time to write. Kentucky is where I wrote my book, Bright Dead Things, which came out in 2015. On the day of its release, it was nominated for the long list of the National Book Award. Oh, wow. And so that was a very pivotal moment in Mm -hmm. my creative life that shifted really quite a bit of the way I thought about what was going to happen next, because I had no idea. No one knows what's going to (laughs) happen next. That's the most pivotal (laughs) thing about life. We never know. Yeah, I remember it coming out and it was like a big event. Mm -hmm. Everybody was excited because you had had books before that. So... I want to talk about those a little bit. As I was reading through your books, I couldn't get my hands on your chapbooks, but Mm. I read all the others. And I feel like there's a clear trajectory where your writing shifts into what we know as distinctly Ada Limon poems. Mm. Um, I'd say they're marked by a strong voice and a clear radar for delight in the everyday. Uh, Your first two books, Lucky Wreck and This Big Fake World, are outliers. As you were writing them, can you remember what some of your attentions were? I found it Interesting that this big fake world is a story in verse. Did you or have you ever wanted to become a novelist? Yeah, that's lovely. I love this big fake world. It's a novel in verse or a story in verse. I still remember writing it and where I was at the time. Like many writers, I felt so sick of myself. Yeah. I had a moment where I thought, if I put the I in a poem one more time, <laughs> I just don't want to do it. You can see the shift. In Lucky Wreck moments where I do 
shift into the third person. Mm -hmm. She enters the world, a ready, set, go girl. She comes with a list of things she cannot see. Um, And then when I was writing Lucky Rat, I mean, writing this big fake world, it felt so nice to inhabit other people's worlds. And it features the lady at the hardware store and the man in the gray suit. The man in the gray suit shifts his life and falls in love with the lady at the hardware store. And there's a love affair between them. I just needed to imagine a a different kind of world for a while. And it was nice to inhabit that in my mind. I have written three novels. I don't share them with anyone because to me, they were projects or experiments, efforts. I love doing them. But I could see where they could go further, but I didn't have as much interest in bringing them to the next level. I think it taught me a great deal Mm -hmm. about storytelling. Yeah. About the imagination. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes as writers, we give the imagination over to the prose writers. And we forget that poets get to have the imagination too. Mm-hmm. So I think the novels really help ignite and remind me about the incredible power of the mind. Yeah. And how far we can travel in our own imagination. Oh, I love that. You no. talked about the secret poems that yeah. you write. Mm-hmm. I think it's important that poets remember that you can just write things for yourself. Yes. And you book three novels just for yourself yeah. just to understand imagination. And I think that's very clear in your work. I'm thinking of Downhearted and yeah. poems like that. Um, with Lucky Rack and This Big Fake World, they were published relatively close together. Were you writing them simultaneously or was one manuscript done and you were shopping it around? How did that work? I think Lucky Rank was done before this big fake world. What happened, I was sending them out at the same time. Hmm. And I was entering contests. Both of those books were contests winners. Hmm. And that's how they got published. I still remember getting the phone call from Autumn House about Lucky Wreck. Hmm. And I was over the moon. I thought, this is amazing. It was chosen by Jean Valentine, who I had never worked with at NYU, but who was at NYU while I was there. And then it was only six months later, so Lucky Wreck hadn't even come out, that I got a phone call about this big fake world. I remember having the fear, because many of these contests that we enter as new writers, whatever age we are, but as we send out new books, Mm -hmm. many of them are first book contests. Yeah. So I was a little scared when the woman called me from Pearl Editions to accept this big fake world. I said, I just want you to know that I already have a first book that's coming out. And she said, no, this can be a second book. It's it's just a prize. Lucky Wreck came out in March of 2006. And this big fake world came out like five months afterwards. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. How did it feel to have two books in the world that close together? I put together a tiny tour for myself and included readings at my parents' house and things like that. I went to AWP in Austin and did a reading at UT Austin. People invited me places and I put it together. But of course, I paid for it myself and tried to figure out how to put together this little trip. When this big fake world came out, I didn't have any more time off that I could take from the magazine world. And I also just didn't have the funds to put myself on a little tour. So the only thing I regret is that it was so beautiful to have them both out. But I still think that I I didn't give as as much light as I wish I could have to this big fake world. And that was just because I was a woman working in Brooklyn and making a living, (laughs) but with no excess income whatsoever. And that that was a little hard was that I was Mm -hmm. I I still feel like, oh, that book deserves a little more light. Yeah, that's a reality for all writer, new poet. Important to talk about. We just yeah. don't talk about it enough. I you feel like there's know. a strange embarrassment around money. And I think it's really important that artists talk about it. I think it's really important that artists of color talk about it. It helps people recognize that they're not alone for whatever reason. Yeah. That's okay. And that they're not alone. <laughs> yeah. I love that. As I mentioned earlier, your work is distinct. Your poems are voice driven, unfolding deliberately, paced narratives, and building on extended metaphor. Often they have a quick turn of revelation at the end. I think for most writers, there's a moment where they recognize what makes their work truly theirs. Was there a certain poem where you realized you had to take your stride or perhaps a moment where you felt like you understood what made your poems truly yours? Thank you for all the praise and that beautiful question. I think, I don't know if there was a specific moment as much as a recognition 
that poems could be talking to other people and that on the other end, there didn't always have to be another poet. There could also be a person that had never read a poem or maybe read prose. Maybe they were just people that loved novels or they read the short stories or whatever it was. And I thought, what about if I wrote poems for not just poets? And that was a shift. And I think that when I look at my work now, even though I'm still writing, like the, the, all my first readers are writers, all my first readers are poets, my main editor is my stepfather. Oh. And he was a short story writer for years. He doesn't write prose much at all anymore, but he just has a really keen eye and he has a big heart. And I have always really admired the way that he looked at my poems. He didn't graduate from college. He's, you know, not someone that he's extremely educated, but all in a way that he did on his own. Yeah. And I think being raised in a community where everyone found art at their own pace allowed me to open myself up to the opportunities of writing for not just a contained community, not just for people with MFAs and college degrees, but for everyone. That shift is really evident in the book Bright Dead Things. Yeah. Who are some of your first readers who I know we don't write alone. Who are the people that help support you and are in community with you? The community is so important. And it can feel sometimes like we are writing alone, which is hilarious. Because we're not. And we're in conversation. Every poem's in conversation with whatever we just read. Every poem's in conversation with the beautiful conversation we had at lunch today. All of these things with our life, with our bodies, with what ails us, with, mm. with what fuels us. Poems will be different depending on whether or not we're hydrated or rested. For me... My first readers are my stepfather, Brady, and then my mother. But then a group of poets, primarily from my graduate school days at NYU, Jennifer L. Knox, Jason Schneiderman, um, Natalie Diaz, not from graduate school, but from later on as, as po in the poetry world, Adam Clay. And yeah, there's so many, but being able to have friends that you can send poems to and that will immediately get back and encourage you. Even if they give you like a little, oh, I would fix this or this, that's fine. But as long as they're like, keep going. And you'd be surprised. I'm on book six. Mm -hmm. Seventh will be coming. And we still need all the encouragement we can get. There's no wow. part of me that ever doesn't need to hear keep going. How did you identify them as readers for your work? I know sometimes young writers are trying to find the right folks to read their work and engage with it and help. I yeah. Is there a thing you like? I was Jennifer Knox and Jason Scheiderman, both from graduate school. There was a particular way that they write really differently. And so they were never trying to make me do what they do. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was a part of all, all of our relationship. Jason is incredibly intellectual, philosophical. Jen's work is really muscular and super, it's funny, but it's got a dangerous edge to it. And I think mine is much more heart-centered. And there's not a part of it that we don't ever say, oh, well, you should be doing this because that's what I do. Yeah. Instead, they know me well enough and trust me that, oh, this is what I think you want to be doing, or this is what I think this intention is. Yeah. And so I think that was part of why we've all stuck together as a group of readers for each other, mm. is that we trust the other person to not be rewriting our poems in their own voice because our voices are so distinctly different. But kindness, above all, people also getting back to you. There's the times where you send poems out and they don't respond and you think, oh, okay, probably not the person I'll be exchanging poems with. Yeah. So that's a big part of it. And yeah, kindness and encouragement, earlier, above all. <laughs> earlier I talked to Carmen and... She mentioned, I was asking how she gets her authors to create the innovative and just wildly um, spectacular pieces that they do. And yeah. it's that encouragement. Oh, I recognize that you're doing this and mm -hmm. then helping them amplify it. Which yeah. Which sounds like they're doing for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like there's also a level now, because we've worked together for so long since we were in graduate school, that 
they can also say, oh, you've done this before. <laughs> yeah. They can say, oh, maybe oh, it's a beautiful sister poem to this poem. Mm -hmm. Or they can say, this is essentially this other poem that you wrote. Yeah. And that's really important, too, to build those relationships so you have that kind of longevity with those people. Yeah. Yeah. Were you guys in workshops together? We were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you remember who were some of your workshop leaders? My first workshop um, was Phil Levine. Oh, wow. It was incredible. Beautiful. Another person who's had an influence on many writers. That workshop was everything to me. He was very tough, mm. but taught me what to fight for, what yeah. to hold on to. He often, he was always alone in his office hours. I feel like everyone was scared of him. <laughs> I would go to his office hours like every day and just hang out with him and just chat with him because he was just, and he re, he'd read anything you offer. That was a really am amazing experience. And then right after that, it was Sharon Olds. So I went from this sort of very tough person with a hard sense of the poem. And then, and then Sharon, who another great mind, both of them yes, incredibly intelligent. True. But she is very interested in creating a safe and tender environment for the writer, whereas Phil was doing a much more tough love yeah. workshop. That's a nice balance, though. I think it was really important for me to have them both the very first year. I feel yeah. like it probably helped you hone your sensibilities about how to edit and self-edit. Yeah, and there were times where I could hear Phil's voice in my head, right? And there were yeah. times where I could hear Sharon's voice in my head. And it was like, oh, these, these are both really important people to have as I move forward as a writer. Do you still feel as you're writing, do you hear them at all? Or how do you just... You know what? I don't think I hear them. Sometimes <laughs> when I edit my poems, I can imagine... I think they're still there. They're more faint whispers now, but they're definitely still there. The biggest thing that I have to think about who I was in my 20s in that graduate program, so much of what you do as a young poet is mimic. Now I almost can't hear them. But it's not because they're not there. It's because I don't want to borrow <laughs> from their beautiful oeuvre of work. They are who they are. And I don't want to have too much influence because as a 20-year-old, I was like, oh, I will, I will figure out how to make these poems by really trying to mimic what they did. I'm very interested in continuing to listen to the voice underneath the voice that's my own. Do you feel like you continue to surprise yourself by what that voice tells you mm. as you're writing? Yeah. It changes all the time. It shifts all the time. Sometimes it's doing more grief work than I expect. Mm. Uh, and sometimes it's highly irreverent. Yeah. A little more rebellious than I expect. But I think, yeah, it is always surprising me. I started meditating in earnest in 2007. So much of what they teach you when you're learning to meditate is this presence in the body and this idea of being able to notice your own thoughts. It's not really emptying the mind because that's a very difficult to do, but there's moments of stillness that exist. Mm -hmm. And I have found that my meditation practice going on almost 20 years has really helped me continue to hear that voice because I've been able to continually figure out moments of stillness and find stillness in even the abundant chaos that is life. I didn't know that my meditation practice would be so important to my poetry work, but I'm really glad that I have them both. Yeah, I think that's important. And it definitely shows in your work. You mentioned the quiet, and I thought immediately of the quiet machine. Yeah. You mentioned that you're on book seven. Mm. I have a question about that. You've been steadily publishing a book every three to four years mm -hmm. since the first two. What are you working on currently? And when's the next one coming out? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of great projects that I'm excited about. The next poetry book will come out in 2025. And that's going to be a new and selected. Oh. Yeah, which I'm really excited about. I'm also scared about. There's something to be in your late 40s that you're like, wait, this is too soon for a new and selected. <laughs> but book seven is about the time they ask that of you. So I'm putting that together. 
there's a lot of new work in that new and selected as well. Um, a lot of the work coming together in one place, which is exciting. In this October, my poem that is engraved on the spacecraft is being illustrated by the incredible Czech illustrator, Peter Cease, and it's being turned into a children's book. Oh. And so that'll come out in October of year. And so those are the things that I'm working on now. And then there's a children's book that's coming out in January 2025, which is the poem And to the Fox oh. from The Herding Kind. Two children's books in the work, and then the new and selected. And then after that, I think that I have already started a new book of poems. Book eight. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's a lot of things to be working on. A lot of things. And I'm different from what you've done so far. Yeah, yeah. No, and, I, and of course, just this week or last week, we launched the anthology You Are Here, which is um, 50 different contemporary poems from folks that are speaking back to the natural world. And that's been a really amazing project too. And that's my first anthology that I've ever done. So it feels like there's a lot of new things in the, in, in the works which I'm excited about, but poetry is my home. Yeah. And, and writing my own poetry is still my focus and my joy. Yeah. So it'll continue. I think my goal is to be a, a really beautiful 100-year-old <laughs> sitting <laughs> on the porch, feeding my birds, and writing poems. Oh, I love that. Just like Merwin, yes. Uh, how have you been thinking about the new and selected? How are you? What kinds of things are on your mind as you're choosing poems from the past? Yeah. Are you thinking about? It's very interesting. <laughs> it's very interesting to me because I have favorites, mm. but then I also know what other people's favorites are. Like now I, I've been doing this long enough, 20 some years, where now I have students who say, oh, this was the, they're graduating from their graduate programs, but they say, oh, I read this poem of yours in high school or whatever it was. And so now, I have this sort of, oh, wow, of course, yes, it's been 14 years since that book or since this or since that. And so I think that the way that I'm hoping to think about it is a celebration of the first half. Oh, <laughs> I mean, it's this sort of celebration of the first half with, with the implication that we are just getting started. Yeah, that's probably the best way to approach it. <laughs> and so... The new poems that you're writing, are they in conversation with some of the old ones or are they their own kind of yes. thing and part of the eighth book? That's a great question. I feel like there are, there are poems that are in conversation. Yeah. Because I don't think they're, it's one life. Yeah. So how can they not be in conversation sometimes, right? But there's also the poem that is going on the spacecraft to the Europa Clipper that will launch in October, that poem will be in there, right? Because it's an occasional poem that came out of that. There's a poem called Startlement, which I wrote for the National Climate Assessment, for the front matter of the National Climate Assessment. And that poem will be in there. So there'll be some sort of more, if you think of it, more public-facing poems. Yeah. And But I want that to be balanced with some really private poems. Mm -hmm. The big thing for me, because I actually do have quite a bit of work, Mm -hmm. is not putting too many new poems in there because I want it to be many, but then I also want to make sure that I start to think about the next book and what that will look like and what poems need to go in that one. Yeah. I think we should probably talk about the elephant in the room. You're the first Latina <laughs> to be the Poet Laureate. How has your tenure as the Poet Laureate felt and what's been your favorite project so far in the role? Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, being the first of anything is always a double-edged sword. It is, yeah. <laughs> because it's, of course, an honor and there's a beautiful gift to it and you want to fill it with all of the joy and light and power that you can. Yeah. But then there's another level in which you think, well, how is this possible? How has this not happened before? And then there's another level where there's a pressure because you feel like you want to, anything that I do, I also want to do in an excellent way. And yet it's very easy to think, oh, now I'm not only representing my, representing myself, every Latina yes. <laughs> yeah, the in the world. <laughs> so I have to slough that off sometimes because it's very easy for me to be hard on myself and mm -hmm. 
to be like, oh, let me think of the ways I'm failing. I think I really have been reframing a lot of that in my mind and to think about just what a joyous opportunity this has been. I think I was really overwhelmed in the beginning. Just to give context is that, so today is April 10th, right? Mm -hmm. I've already now served two terms, my first term beginning in September of uh, 2022. And I think in September of 2022, I could just barely catch my breath. Yeah. It was overwhelming. It was beautiful. But I immediately did events at the White House. I immediately was just like, bam. And I think now there's a little more, okay, now I know what we're doing. I know what this, no, I know what the role requires. And I know what I want to do within it. Yeah. And so it's been a really remarkable experience to you start out of breath and now I'm getting to a place of, oh, I know how to breathe. Just had to remind myself a little bit. And the big thing that there's so many things, so many exciting things we've done so far. And the collaboration with NASA for the poem on the spacecraft has been huge and wonderful. And working with the NASA team has been amazing. And then now, this week, we just launched the You Are Here Poetry in the Natural World project. And there's one element of it, which is a anthology of 50 original nature poems by contemporary poets writing today. And this book is just incredible. It's published by Milkweed Editions in partnership with the Library of Congress. And it's hardcover and gorgeous and urgent and strange and full of joy and praise and also grief and rage. And it's just really one of the honors of my lifetime to put it together because the poems are just so exquisite. And then the second part of that is that they are working with the Poetry Society of America, along with the National Park Service to put seven different poems in seven different national parks around the United States. And that project will continue, but we will, I will go and visit them, all of them, and unveil these poetry installations, which are basically oversized picnic tables that people can sit around. And the parks that are included are Cape Cod, National Seashore, the Everglades, Smoky Mountains, Cuyahoga Valley, then Redwoods, Mount Rainier, Saguaro, and is that it? I think that's it. And it's just been incredible to work with these partners in making this happen because it feels like I'm all for the unexpected and surprising interaction with poetry. Mm. I don't know if that's happened for you. <laughs> I'm on the bus or I've been many times in New York City where I'm like, oh, and I, I read a poem by Tracy K. Smith and I still remember exactly where I was standing when I first read that poem. And uh, there are so many different kind of experiences that we have with poetry, but it's often the ones that are surprising or unexpected that stick with you for a long time or, or shift you. And so I'm very excited about to see what happens with these poems in these parks and how people interact with them. And then there's a chance every poem on the side of it has written what would you say to the landscape around you? Oh. And so people can respond and write their own poem. And there's a hashtag, you are here poetry. And they can just share it and then make their own poems. And it doesn't even have to be a poem. It could just be a line. It could be a sentence. But I'm encouraging people to not only read, but to also write in response to the natural world. Yeah. Who are some of the poets represented by those national parks and those yeah. tables? Thank you. This comes full circle a little bit because I was really happy with the Redwoods National Parks is that I get to include a poem called Alone by Francisco X. Arlacón. And it's just been so beautiful to have his work there since he was such a light in my life and in my journey. And when he passed, I remember feeling very sorrowful that I hadn't had a chance to thank him. And in some ways, I feel like this is my way of thanking him. So his poem will be in the Redwoods. Mount Rainier has A.R. Ammons, which is a great poem. Yeah. And then Mary Oliver has a poem. We'll, we'll have a poem in Cape Cod. Uh, then we have Lucille Clifton in the Smoky Mountains. We have June Jordan in the Everglades. And then in sort of a tribute to, uh, with Jean Valentine in Cuyahoga Valley, and then in a, as a tribute to, to Joy Harjo's incredible project as for her laureateship, which was Living, Living Nations, Living Words, um, 
when we were discussing which poem would go into Soro, we were thinking that it could be a living poet, which is the only living poet that we're using. And her name is Ophelia Zapata. And the poem's just incredible. And the event for Saguaro will actually be just featuring her and I'll be in the background. But it's an opportunity to also talk about indigeneity and the impact the national parks have had on sacred lands. And so I think it's just, the project really has come together in a way that continues to surprise and delight me as we go forward. I think it's going to be really powerful. Yeah. I'm excited about it. I hope I get to go to these parts. Please do. (laughs) I guess just a general question to conclude, but what do you hope for the future of the laureate show? Yeah, it's very interesting because you can't help but when you're in this role to just really start thinking about the next person that will hold this role, which is interesting because it it goes by very fast. Like one term, you could just do one term, but that's just a, a year. And really the year is September through April. It's like an academic year yeah. or congressional year. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, for one, would really love to see someone keep up the momentum yeah. of bringing poetry into places that we may not expect it. And I would also love the laureateship to be a way of talking to not just poets, but to readers of all ages and of of all different kinds types of educational backgrounds i would also love for the laureateship to to bring people to the library and to celebrate libraries i know that for me my local library in sonoma california is still very significant in my life it's so beautiful and it's where i remember first reading poems and first reading that that thrill of going to the library and coming back with a stack of books, thinking, how is this, how am I even allowed to do this? And I think also for me in my last term, what I really hope to do is to be as inclusive as possible and to really highlight the different ways that poetry can be available to us, that not all of us are going to like the same poem. Not all of us are going to have the same reaction to the same poetry and that's okay and so I feel like if I can allow all readers to have some kind of new curiosity when it comes to poetry that would really be very heartening for me and I hope that as I tour the national parks and then have my last event a year from almost a year from today that that I can look back and really say to myself, yeah, I left it all on the map, that I amplified a lot of different voices and for the most part amplified the power that poetry can have. Thank you so much for this conversation. I think we're all very lucky to have you our Poet Laureate. <laughs> Thank you so much. Those were really beautiful questions.